Hi everyone, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I am your host, Kelly Cothran, and I'm so glad you could join us today. I am a girl that loves a great pair of shoes, especially my high heels and stilettos. People always ask me, how do you wear those heels all day? But little did I know that this might be a problem for my foot health in the future. Today's webinar is entitled, Walk the Walk in the Right Shoes. We are going to learn why it's important to choose the right shoe for whatever activity you're engaged in. I have with me foot expert and podiatrist, Dr. James Hahn, who will walk us through a few foot health tips. So let's learn a little, about, little bit about today's speaker, Dr. Hahn. Dr. Hahn is board certified by the American Board of Podiatric Medicine. His clinical interests include sports medicine, and he practices at our Kelsey Siebold main campus, Meyerland, and Spring Medical and Diagnostic Center. When he's not caring for patients, he enjoys participating in sports, especially baseball. He is also a board certified athletic trainer. So let's jump straight in and kick things off with our poll. What time of day is the best time to shop for shoes? I will give you a few seconds to answer and we'll reveal, reveal the results at the end. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the polls, and at the end of the webinar, I will reveal the results and take any questions you may have. Now, I will pass it over to Dr. Hahn. Thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to do a webinar. Today, we're going to talk about a foot. Um, to me, the foot's very important because this is what I do for my practice, but I think the foot is very unique in a way that it has a lot of components in them. Uh, they're made out of vast majority of 26 bones, multiple layers of muscles, nerves and arteries and ligaments and soft tissues that connects all these structures together so we can function and carry our daily lives well without minimal difficulties. One of the things that we most often encounter is uh, patients come and ask what bunion is. Uh, bunion is very common actually. A lot of people have them and if some of us will look at our foot right now we will see a, some of us will see a little bump coming out inside of our foot next to our big toe and it basically bunion is enlargement of the bone of the next to close to the big toe that's kind of pressing inward and bunions can grow as the times go by and sometimes bunions can become severe and can start pinching on those toes that are next to it. And some of the shoe selections that we may choose can significantly contribute to how bunions can affect our daily lives and sometimes they cause pain. And uh, similar to anything, some of the bunion treatments include an anti-inflammatory medication. We always told them to wear shoe selections that can minimally cause pain to the foot, so a wider toe box. Sometimes adding a space in between the toes can decrease the pressure. And always try to wear shoes with sensible heel heights and occasionally custom shoe arch support or even over-the-counter uh, over arch support can help with the abundant pain and progression. And sometimes if everything fails, then we may have to go with surgery. And another thing we, uh, we're uh, commonly asked was for corns and calluses and probably vast majority of us will have corns and callus sometime in our lifetime and some of us will have it right now. Calluses and corns are similar. They're interchangeable. Sometimes calluses happens on the bottom and corns happens on top of the toes but basically they are thick in skin due to some type of pressure being applied to that skin area. Some are small, a lot of them are round, but bunions and, um, the, I'm sorry, the corns and calluses can be very painful because anytime you have some thick skin built underneath the pressurized area and if you're stepping on that, it can quietly become painful. And they typically happen on the plantar aspect where you're putting pressure every time you walk or stand. 
Some of the treatments include uh, we can shave them down, ask them to wear some padding to accommodate the area to decrease the pressure. And occasionally, we may have to do a surgical procedure to remove that bony prominence that's causing that calluses to form. Ingrown toenail, well, this is, again, uh, it happens to many patients, and ingrown toenails can actually become infected. Uh, the way though your, no, uh, way your toenail grows is something your mom and dad has something to it, uh, but something we do can also contribute to becoming a painful or symptomatic ingrown toenail. By definition, ingrown toenails is when toe borders, outside of the borders, start curving in and digging into the skin. And they can cause secondary infection, sometimes can collect some pus. But besides from being very painful, it can be dangerous because an infection can set in, especially patients with immunocompromised, such as diabetic patients, can have a lot of problem with that. So some of the causes, uh, nail trimming, uh, inability to reach the toe, sometimes thick toenails can contribute to pressure. And sometimes when patients have ingrown toenail, they do something called bathroom surgery. They go to the bathroom, start digging on it, and they can actually cause more problem. So what are some treatments for an ingrown toenail? Uh, we often give oral antibiotics if it's infected and, then, and, then, and the infection needs to be addressed. And, occasion, and the majority of the time, we do a partial nail avulsion. Occasionally, we may have to do total, no, total nail avulsion, which is very rare. Uh, it's a very simple procedure. We can do it in the office. Vast majority of the time, we numb your toe, cut the part of the ingrown toenail that's bothering you, and we can prevent it. We can put some medicine in there so that ingrown part of the nail will never grow back again. Posterior tibial tendonitis, well, this is kind of a fancy word, but a lot of times patients will complain of flat feet, and some people come and ask us, well, I didn't have a flat feet, but now I'm getting flat foot later. Well, not all patients with a flat foot or flat feet you know, have posterior tibial tendonitis, but this is a tendon that sits inside of your ankle and comes down to the foot and inserts to the mid part of the foot. This tendon helps you hold your arch up in some asp somewhat, and patients who do a lot of repetitive chronic overloading of this tendon, such as walking exercise, new type of activity that requires long standing, or some patients with a little bit of bladder feet will have a higher tendency to develop posterior tibial tendonitis. Just like any tendonitis, you know, probably one of the best treatments is rest and modify your activity. Occasionally, we use some anti-inflammatory medicine, physical therapy, biomechanic control with some arch supports and orthotics, occasional braces if it, all these things fail, and again, if everything fails, then surgical intervention might be needed. Tendonitis, like we just talked about, tendonitis is basically an inflammation of a tendon in our body. Obviously, right now we're talking about tendonitis of our feet. Achilles tendon is a large tendon that is situated in the back of your heel. Uh, comes down to the posterior back of your heel attached to the back side of the heel. But <clears throat> Achilles tendonitis is one of those tendons that often get inflamed. And a couple reasons are, you know, the overusage like we just talked about, or vast majority of the time we'll develop some tightness of that area as we get older or as we start some other exercise. Then those tight tendons are often overloaded and overworked and they will start to inflame and it can give you some quite discomfort. Again, symptoms are pain and swelling at the distal end where the area that attaches to the bone, and occasionally certain motion or range of motion can cause pain in that area. Athlete's feet. Uh, a lot of us have athlete's feet sometime in our life. Uh, it's basically a fungal infestation of the skin of our feet. Uh, it can become dry, it can be scaly, it, and it can be very itchy. And... Uh, sometimes it can form a little bit of pustule, like a pimple-like formation, and it can be contagious. Uh, so who gets them? Well, all of us do sometimes um, because the fungus likes to grow in a dark, moist area, and uh, our feet are dark because we wear shoes and socks, and it can become moist because we often sweat. Um, it can cause... I mean, you can cause some other symptoms, and sometimes when patients get very severe athlete's feet, they can get some localized and superficial infection that needs some antibiotics to address them. So treatments include 
topical antifungal medicine. They are a vast majority, a vast variety of antifungal medicines in the store. Sometimes they do require oral antifungal to improve them and improper hot foot hygiene. Um, prevention probably is the best way to treat them. Uh, you know, just as we just talked about, it's very important to keep your feet dry. Uh, if there's less moisture, athlete's feet tends to get a whole lot better. Um, whenever you go to public places where you share a lot of moist areas, such as a public pool or shower, it's probably best if you're some type of sandals or uh, shower shoes so that you don't, you decrease the chance of getting contaminated by the fungus living in that area. If you do sweat a lot or, you know, it's a good idea to change your socks a couple of times a day to, again, try to decrease the moisture in the area. Drying powder, preventive athlete powder is a good idea for patients who are susceptibly getting to the get into, uh, athlete's feet. And just try to wear good shoes and change your shoes every now and then. It's not, if you're sweating a lot and if you have a choice, it's probably a good idea you alternate shoes every now and then so that you don't get one shoes get soaked and get uh, moisture all the time. Plantar fasciitis. Uh, this is one of the very common things that we see here as our foot specialist in Kelsey Siebel Clinic. Heel pain. A lot of times patients come into clinic and complain of heel pain. It says, you know what, I've been having heel pain for a while. It hurts when I stand. And a lot of times patients complain what they call post-static dyskinesia, which means that when I get up in the morning, first couple of steps is very painful. It kind of gets a little better after I walk for a little bit, but then it gets hurtful again when you stand on your feet for a long time. Well, it's due to the chronic inflammation of a fibrous band on the bottom of the foot called plantar fascia. It starts from the heel and goes all the way to the front parts of your foot. Every time you stand, your body pushes your foot uh, the foot in your arch down and it causes the plantar fascia to pull away from the heel bone attachment. Well, when that band gets tight, they start to pull a little harder and repetitive pulling of the band can cause inflammation and swelling at the origin of the plantar fascia and that becomes very painful. And if that goes on for a while, your body will may start to take and develop a little bit of heel spur. But your vast majority of your pain is coming from inflammation of soft tissue called plantar fascia. So that's why you go see doctors, they ask you to do stretching exercise because if you keep those plantar fascia stretched and flexible, you know, you don't pull as hard as they you do, so the, your chances of getting better is significantly improved, and more importantly, you'll prevent it from coming back. But again, just any type of anti uh, inflammatory process, rice is good modalities, Occasionally, we put patients in brace or arch support, cortical steroid injection, NSAID to uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory, sometimes oral steroid to cut the swelling down. And there are some other available options like shockwave or sometimes if all conservatives fail, we can uh, treat patients with immobilization, sometimes casting them or even surgical procedures to release the fascia so that band is no longer pulling and causing that swelling to occur. Again, we talked about Achilles tendonitis briefly in the, a little while ago. Again, it's calling, it's a stretching and pulling of the Achilles tendon. Just like any tendonitis, any plantar fascia, rest significantly helps. Anti-inflammatory, cut the swelling down. Heel lift, orthotics, or dosis device to offload that pressure. Sometimes we need some physical therapy. Again, if you're not getting better, immobilization and surgical intervention might be needed to resolve the situation. Perineal tendon is a tendon that sits on the outside of your foot. Uh, often, uh, you can injure this tendon with ankle sprains or overuse, just like any other tendons. Symptoms are similar to other tendonitis, pain, swelling, uh, painful with active and resistant eversion of the foot, and along with activity. Uh, again, the treatments are rest, anti-inflammatory medication, rehab, strapping, embracing, and occasionally immobilization, surgical intervention. It's important to say when we treat tendonitis, uh, we live in very busy and active lifestyle. It's pro sometimes it's necessary for patients to modify their activity. Uh, you know, that we have patients that will come and say, well, I would like to do four miles of running every other day, but I want my foot to get better sometime. And occasionally, 
we will try our best to not to hinder your lifestyle, but lifestyle uh, modification sometimes be needed some short period of time in order to improve your tendonitis because the foot is one of those things that we use all the time regardless if we have pain or not. So modification of activity can be an important part of your treatment. So sum it up with the tendonitis, as we just talked about, rest is a very important part of the tendonitis. Rice, uh, ice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Occasional knee, we need immobilization if it becomes persistent and not getting better with the first line of treatment such as NSAID. Injection, sometimes we do to a tendon, but there are some studies that say repeated injections to the tendon area can cause the tendons to rupture and surgical procedures to uh, address if the tendonitis goes on for a long period of time. It can cause some damage to the tendon. And occasionally, it can cause tearing, so we need to repair those damages. Besides from things we just talked about, there are other things can affect foot, um, which can affect from the other systemic disease such as gout, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, vascular insufficiency, and obviously trauma such as a fracture. Uh, one of the things that we want to talk about that we see often here are diabetic foot. Um, diabetes is very prevalent in our city and there are patients with diabetes who have a lot of foot problems. Um, some of the in, patients with uncontrolled diabetes they will develop diabetic neuropathy they lose some level of sensation in their feet and they can lead to very bad thing. Um, if we develop blisters on our foot, we kind of notice it right away because it will feel that blister, but some, some of our patients with diabetes don't have that protective sensation. So those blisters can develop into an ulcer, uh, especially with the vascular insufficiency. Those ulcers can get pretty deep and it can seed it to the bone and that's how some of the patients will end up getting surgical amputation of the toe or some part of the foot, or even an entire lower extremity. There are other things can contribute to the dangers of diabetic foot, such as non-palpable pedal pulses, uh, decrease in sensation, foot deformity, and history of a foot ulcer in the past will significantly increase the chance of patient getting future foot problems. So, it's a good idea for patients with diabetes to come see and get their feet checked out at least once a year. Uh, if there's any other underlying problem, your foot specialist can help you guide to appropriate doctors to try to resolve that issue or try to prevent it from getting it worse. So, shoes. We all like shoes. Uh, we all have a lot of, many pairs of them. So, <laughs> answer right now. Um, I'll have always recommend patients to shop their shoes in the afternoon or evening because our foot does swell throughout the day and your foot size in the evening might not be the same as in the morning. And I, can, I cannot stress this enough, try on both sides of the shoes, right and left. Uh, a lot of times we just put one side and walk around a couple of steps, this feels good, but then when you come home put the other side on, it might not be the same comfort that you experience on the other side. So walk around a little bit. And if you don't know your foot size, I will go to one of the reputable foot places out there. Get your foot measure, length and width. Um, we always recommend you wear shoes that were some rigid soles that you don't walk around and flip-flop or papers in soles. How shoes should stay at home. That <laughs> uh, You shouldn't do eight-hour walking mall exercise with your house flip-flop. That's probably not a good idea. And when you do regular exercise, good shoes is very paramount. Use appropriate shoes. When you wear new shoes that feels a little uncomfortable in the front, you may want to break them in. You don't want to use your brand new shoes and do your multi-hour activity. You may want to, you may develop blisters or some other foot problems if you do that. So walking shoes, I and mean, there's a lot of different type of shoes out there. Walking shoes are good shoes as long as you go by um, decent shoes. To, I won't recommend you go buy dollar, two dollar shoes at a uh, off the off the non-reputable places. But it's great for light walking in the trail. Uh, it will prevent you from getting superficial pl uh, blisters and stuff like that. It will give some some arch stability. So, like I said, when you're buying shoes, buy shoes that confines and shape your foot. Some patients will have a narrower foot. Some people have a wider feet. So get your feet measured and buy shoes that fit your foot. 
cross training shoes well we we do a lot of things some people do a lot of jogging some people do a lot of weightlifting if you are one of those weekend warriors do likes to do various things little and there little and there crossing training shoe might not be a bad idea uh, these shoes are designed to cross between certain activities and able to give you some stability and support uh, however this if you're into a certain activity more um, regularly uh, then you probably will best serve yourself buying a activity specific shoe if you're if you're a jogger you probably want to buy a shoes that fit more for jogging so if you're doing this and that a little bit of a little, little bit of a lot of things the cross training shoes might not be a bad idea well sandals and flip-flop I get a lot of these questions too they are easy to go in some they are very nice to wear on the house uh, they can protect your foot from minimal walking, walking on a hot sand in the beach, and they will keep your feet dry and protected from the some of the stuff on the bottom of the foot. But they're convenient, and lately it almost became a fashion. But these shoes are really not designed to have you go through many hours of walking. Uh, they don't. Their lack of some of the supports, or their foot is very, their sole is very soft, so they might not give you that rigid support that your body need. And please try, try not to do an activity or sporting activity in your sandals. I've seen many patients that uh, cause a lot of foot problems trying to play football or soccer or even some other climbing with the sandals. So please try to use sandals sparingly in the house or in the beach, but not as your daily, everyday power exercise and power walking shoes. Heels. Um, this is another question we get a lot. Heels are very nice shoes. Uh, I think a lot of uh, patients will like them. And now I've seen heels there are very high, uh, even five or six inches. Um, and uh, they're okay. I'm not, I don't have anything against patients wearing that for certain occasions to fit the occasion and clothing they wear. But I probably recommend that you should stay away from doing a lot of walking in them. Uh, it can cause foot problems. It can cause all of the foot problems called capsulitis or metatarsalgia. But, I mean, I'm, you can wear them. Try to use them sparingly, but try to wear shoes that are more fitted to you. Uh, try not to walk too much in those high heels so because it can hurt your back and knees and your foot as well. So overall foot health, check your feet daily. Uh, feet our foot is, is the farthest thing from our heart, so we tend to kind of not give it attention until something happens to you, but please check them. Check top of your foot, bottom of the foot. Stretch frequently. They will cut down a lot of the plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis. Pedicure, um, if you enjoy them, make, go get them. Make sure you find a good place. They use clean tools. I, However, I do not recommend patients to get uh, pedicures if you have severe diabetes with vascular insufficiencies. And please, if you have pain, please seek one of our foot doctors or foot and ankle uh, orthopedists because foot pain is not normal. Uh, pain is a sign from your body there's something wrong with it. So inspect your feet on a daily basis. Wash them regularly between your toes and after, make sure you dry them. Trim your toenails straight as possible. Don't try to curve them. You don't have to cut your toenails so short. Uh, we're not going to think you're any less hygiene because your toenail is a little longer. Uh, make sure your shoe fits properly. Make, uh, purchase shoes late in the day and uh, you should try to replace them if they get old or wear them out. And select and wear the right shoes for the activity that you're engaged. Uh, certainly don't want you to play soccer and running shoes. Uh, alternate shoes if you can. And avoid uh, walking barefoot, especially patients with immunocompromised or patients with diabetes. And be cautious when you're using home remedies uh, and living with diabetes, please see a foot specialist at least once a year or whatever, however they recommend it, depending on your risk factors. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Han. Okay, we're going to take a few questions. We have about five minutes left on the webinar. So if you want to take the time to send us your questions, go right ahead. Oh, it looks like we have quite a few already. Let's see here. 
would diabetic socks be good for non-diabetics as well to promote better circulation? Well, diabetic, I don't think there's such thing that would, such socks that will promote better circulation, but you want to wear well, you know, designed socks. Uh, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to wear diabetic socks for non-diabetic patient, but I don't believe that's going to increase your circulation or anything like that. But try to wear socks that feel comfortable for you, and most importantly, try, try to change at least once a day. Okay. Here's a good question. Is it considered poor circulation when your feet coloration is darker than your complexion? There are a lot of uh, clinical signs that may sh indicate decrease in circulation. Uh, the, probably the best way to do is to do a Doppler exam, but, you know, we don't have that accessibility to everybody. But fetal pulse palpation is very important to try to feel the pulses in your feet. Uh, capillary refill, they squeeze your toes, make sure your toes come back to normal color within five seconds or so. But skin discoloration can be a sign of this bad circulation. So if you start noticing that, I'll recommend you come and see one of the foot specialists. Right. Let's see here. Is it good to put inserts in tennis shoes for support when walking? Support inserts can be helpful for certain patients with certain problems, but there are patients who use supports in certain shoes, such as tennis shoes. It's not a bad idea. Uh, one bad thing about insert is that it's limited in how, what kind of shoes you can get in, but if you used it before and if you like them, and if you can put it in certain shoes, I'll wear them. Let's see here. Oh, here's a, a very interesting question. What are some good exercises to take care of your feet? Well, there are a lot of good exercises. Uh, probably the best exercise you can do is range of motion. I always tell them to write A, B, C, Ds with your foot and ankle. And just good old calf stretching. Uh, if you can lean against the wall and stretch the back of your foot, that's, that will also stretch the bottom of your foot. So as long as you do some good stretching exercise, range of motion, I think they will benefit you significantly. Okay. What are some things you can do to relieve gout from your feet when it occurs? The gout, if you're getting repeated gout problem, I think it's probably best that you go see a rheumatologist and get underlying gout uh, condition treated. However, if you have a certain joint in your foot that's causing pain from the gout, there are things we can do as medications or even a cortical steroid injection in that area can help with that. But in patients with gout, it's very important you get the underlying gout condition treated and control. Okay. I have a question myself. Sure. So I'm, like I said before at the beginning of the webinar, I'm a big heel wearer. Every occasion, every day, I wear my heels. Um, do you recommend that I alternate between heels and flats? Should I pull back a little bit just, you know, to, to keep in mind my foot health in the future? I believe I think it's a good idea to alternate a little bit and try to um, wear more flatter shoes every now and then. But the shoes is something that what you feel the most comfortable with. And if you feel like you can wear certain shoes to a certain level in a certain amount of time, then, I mean, I encourage you to use that. But if you're starting to get some little discomfort, then you probably need to think about changing to a little bit flatter shoes for a while. Okay. Can you do more damage to your feet if you do not fix fat, flat feet by having surgery or orthotics? Also, wearing sandals all the time, can that make you lose your instep? Well, if, if you're not having pain, uh, you know, we're not going to recommend that you go get a drastic surgery to get your flat foot fixed. There's a lot of patients with a flatter feet, and they live very well, perfectly healthy life. But if you start getting pain or any symptom, then I would ask for you to go see one of the foot and ankle specialists. Arch support, that depends. But if you're thinking about using any type of device or orthotics to treat your pets, a flat feet, then I would actually go see someone and seek professional advice before you start using them. You mentioned this earlier um, in the presentation about walking around barefoot. Uh, is there something wrong with walking around barefoot at home? I know we get very comfortable. We've had shoes on all day. We just want to kick them off. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, I walk around barefoot a lot in my house, so sometimes I need to do what I preach. But it becomes more important for patients with diabetic neuropathy because if you don't feel in the bottom of the foot, um, there are a lot of things can become dangerous. There could be a little uh, 
wooden splinter or a little bit of broken glass that happened four months ago, then you accidentally step on it and those become infecting, become a problem in the future. So if you're healthy, you don't have any problem, you probably could walk around, but if you especially if you have diabetes and history of ulcer, then I strongly recommend you don't. Excellent. We'll take one more question. What is the best running form? Uh, we always talk about the best type of shoe we should get, but does your running form affect how we can prevent future foot pain? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, people have come into my clinic and asked that, and I believe that your running form or your walking form has developed because that your body figured out that was the best way to walk and run for you. So I don't know if there's a particular way you can drastically change the way you walk and run. Uh, if you don't have any problem, I'll just stick with it and try not to change it. Thank you so much, Dr. Han. All right, so let's reveal our poll that we took at the beginning of the webinar. I'm going to share it with you. I asked, what time of day is the best time to shop for shoes? And Dr. Han did a great job of explaining that the afternoon and evening are the best times to try on shoes. So next time you go for your next pair of sneakers or stilettos, keep that in mind. All right. Well, that concludes our webinar for today. I want to thank Dr. Han for hosting today's webinar. I really hope it motivated our listeners to take their foot health seriously. That concludes our webinar for today. Please join us next month when Dr. Mina S. Warren presents What to Know About Breast Cancer. And as you know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So ladies and men, men, you need to pay attention too. Be sure to tune in next month, October 8th. Just a reminder before we sign off, we are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Google+. Plus. Be sure to find us and add us, and thanks again for tuning in.